portal hypertension refers to a higher than normal blood pressure in the portal system. A normal range for this pressure is 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. Portal hypertension can also be defined as a portal pressure more than 5 millimeters of mercury higher than the pressure in the inferior vena cava. So the portal system refers to the portal vein, which drains into the liver, and the main vessels that link to the portal vein are the superior mesenteric vein, which comes from the small intestines, the splenic vein, which of course carries blood from the spleen, the inferior mesenteric vein connects onto the splenic vein and carries blood from the large intestine, but the gastric veins connect also onto the portal vein. Another thing to note is the umbilical vein, which is normally obliterated and becomes the round ligament of the liver. But if the pressure in the portal system gets high enough, it can reopen. Varices are dilated veins that result from an increased pressure in the portal system. Inside the liver, you have structures known as sinusoids, which are specialized capillaries within the liver. The hepatocytes of the liver are separated from these sinusoids by a space known as the space of Dies. Venous blood from the portal system mixes with arterial blood from the hepatic artery in the sinusoid and then flows through into a central vein. These central veins collect together in the hepatic veins, which take blood into the inferior vena cava. You can also see a bile ductule, which collects bile produced by the hepatocytes and takes it down towards the gallbladder. The cell in red that you see inside the sinusoid is a Kupfer cell, a specialized type of macrophage that has scavenging and phagocytic activity. The orange star-shaped cells are important in portal hypertension and cirrhosis. These are hepatic stellate cells found in the space of Dies that are involved in fibrogenesis and scar formation in response to liver injury. So what causes pressure in the portal system to increase? The pathophysiology of portal hypertension ultimately comes down to blood being unable to pass smoothly from the portal circulation through the liver and into the inferior vena cava. We typically divide the causes into prehepatic, intrahepatic, and posthepatic causes. But remember that prehepatic here means before the blood gets into the liver, meaning causes in the portal vein itself, while posthepatic causes refer to causes after the liver, so problems involving the inferior vena cava. Prehepatic causes include portal vein thrombosis, splenic vein thrombosis, an arterial venous malformation, and splenomegaly. Intrahepatic causes include the most common cause, cirrhosis, which can come from alcohol abuse, chronic viral hepatitis, metabolic conditions like Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis, or fatty liver disease. In this case, the passage of blood from the portal vein into the hepatic veins is hindered because of the fibrosis seen in cirrhosis, and this increases the resistance to the blood flow. Other intrahepatic causes include primary sclerosis and cholangitis, schizosomiasis because the eggs are deposited and lead to portal fibrosis, and conditions like nodular regenerative hyperplasia. Posthepatic causes include inferior vena cava obstruction, right-sided heart failure, and Bud Chiari syndrome, which is also known as hepatic vein thrombosis. Patients with portal hypertension often have clinical features linked to the underlying disease, most commonly cirrhosis. Mild cirrhosis may be asymptomatic, then with disease progression, they may have fatigue or pruritus, which is itching due to the buildup of bile acid and endogenous release of opioids, jaundice, edema, which may be peripheral, but we may also, of course, see ascites. Gynecomastia may be seen in males as the liver plays a role in balancing testosterone and estrogen levels by sex hormone binding globulin production. Palma erythema occurs for a similar reason as well as nitric oxide release. Spider nevi, a type of telangiectasis, meaning swollen capillaries, and caput medusa, which are distended superficial epigastric veins that radiate from the umbilicus. Hepatosplenomegaly is another potential finding. Patients can also present directly with complications, either of portal hypertension, such as rupture of the varices, esophageal varices formed from buildup of blood from the gastric vein and are the ones that bleed most commonly. From a decreased liver function, we can have hepatic encephalopathy, and the complications of ascites include conditions like spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and hepatorenal syndrome.
For the diagnosis, the physical exam may show signs such as hepatosplenomegaly, ascites or varices, but these signs only suggest portal hypertension. Ultrasound is used to look at the diameter of the portal vein, with measurements above 13 to 15 millimeters being considered a sign of portal hypertension. Using the Doppler setting and measuring the velocity of the blood is also useful. A velocity below 16 centimeters per second in a setting of dilation in the main portal vein is considered diagnostic. Ultrasound can also show the reopening of the umbilical vein and show dilation of the left and short gastric veins, which is further evidence of portal hypertension. The gold standard for assessing the severity is the hepatic venous pressure gradient and is essentially an estimate of the difference between the portal vein and the inferior vena cava pressures. More than 5 is considered portal hypertension, more than 10 is a clinically significant portal hypertension and more than 12 is a risk for varageal hemorrhaging. The treatment is based on treating the underlying cause as well as reducing the pressure in the portal circulation which is mostly achieved by procedures such as the transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, known as TIPS, and preventing complications such as bleeding, which is done by giving medications like beta blockers, nitrates, and vasopressin analogues like terlipressin, as well as surgical treatments like variceal ligation. Hepatic encephalopathy is reduced by giving lactulose, enemas, and antibiotics such as rifaximin and vancomycin, in an attempt to reduce the urea produced by microbes. However, this is still debated. Ascites will be treated both to prevent complications as well as symptomatic relief for the patient. This includes salt restriction in the diet and the use of diuretics as well as paracentesis.